Hello and welcome to The Rundown, a podcast from Politics Home. I'm your host Alan Tolhurst and joining me this week to mark the arrival of our third Prime Minister this year are my two colleagues Adam Payne and Elna Langford. And we're also delighted to have on Conservative MP and former Cabinet Minister Stephen Crabb. So it's been another momentous week, it feels like we say that every time. I think I banned that earlier this year, that you could say momentous week on, on the podcast, but it, it really has been another one of those. So it was started on Monday with the results, as such as they were, of the Conservative leadership contest. Um, Adam, just talk us through what happened on Monday as we found out that Sunak was going to become the next Prime Minister. The, the question heading into Monday was, would Rishi Sunak essentially be unchallenged yeah. uh, and be confirmed as the next Prime Minister and Tory leader on Monday? Or would Penny Morden attract enough support to get on the ballot herself? And right up until the last minute, well, I don't think she put that tweet out confirming that she'd pulled out until, what, five or ten minutes before the... 2 p.m. deadline, um, yeah. Graham Brady statement in, in, in Parliament. The question Monday afternoon was, could Penny Morden pick off enough MPs who were planning to vote Boris Johnson before he announced that he wouldn't actually be running after a weekend of briefing that he would. That was a question. I think her team said she managed to get 90 yeah. nominations from MPs, but she needed 100 to get over the line. Rishi Sunak was confirmed as Prime Minister with, it must be said, a pretty strong mandate from the Parliamentary Party. It didn't go to the Tory party members because as set out in the rules, they didn't need to do that because he'd got the sufficient threshold. And then Rishi Sunak, next Prime Minister, he was sworn in on Tuesday. And we went to, you know, see the King and we had all that choreography of Liz Truss and Sunak going back and forth to Buckingham Palace. And since then, it's been this actually quite glacial process of um, putting together his cabinet and yeah. then his junior ministers, which I believe is, is it still ongoing as we, it is still as, ongoing, as we yeah. speak? Yeah, we had, we were, we were told on Wednesday that we were to expect most of the junior ministerial positions, but by late on Wednesday, we'd only had about half potentially, mm. and most of them were just reappointments. So we're still, we're still, still ongoing. As yeah, well. and, and remiss of me not to mention that Rishi Sunak also had his first Prime Minister's questions up against Keir Starmer. Yeah. Me and Stephen, Stephen were talking before we started recording. It felt in the Commons, it felt like something close to normality, mm. where obviously there are big issues coming, big debates to be had, but it felt like those things are going to play out, famous last words here, it felt like those things are going to play out in a much more normal environment, i.e. Tory backbenchers generally united behind the leader, two leaders, Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak, setting out in policy terms clear dividing lines. It felt I wish there was a better word I could think of other than normal, but it felt it felt quite normal, didn't yeah. it? After the absolute was, yeah, chaos was, that we've had over the last few weeks. It certainly was. It was perhaps getting back to where we'd seen earlier this year. Ellie, going back to the, the cabinet, we saw new people coming in. Just talk us through some of those those big moves that we saw and what kind of we're expecting. Obviously, soon I could said he wanted to sort of draw on all wings of the party. Let's just talk over Sue. We had a lot of people being, we had about 10 people being sacked. We had some some big names coming back. Let's just go through some of those those big names that we saw returning and not just returning, but returning a lot of time to the same role they had prior to July. Well, one of the big ones is Michael Gove is back yeah. as levelling up secretary. Having said in the summer that he was quitting frontline politics yeah. and, you know. And but. managing to be the only person to be sacked in the mass resignations yeah. of last July. We also have Rob back in his old job as deputy PM and as justice secretary. <laughs> I always find it funny that Alistair Jack has just continued as um, Scotland secretary throughout all of this yeah. quietly, <laughs> just sat away in the background. <laughs> he has not moved on. We've got Barclay back in health. He was yep. a health secretary over the summer. Yeah. And there was a lot of people that managed to keep their jobs. James Cleverly, some people suggested that he might lose foreign secretary. Yeah. He obviously backed Boris Johnson over the weekend, but he has managed to keep his job. And obviously he was a big backer of Liz mm. Truss. So that's maybe a bit of a u- unity candidate. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, so on that, we saw some, perhaps some stability at the top. Jeremy Hunt stayed as, as Chancellor. And we saw Swella Braveman come back as Home Secretary and James Cleverly stay as, as Foreign Secretary. So there was sort of stability at those positions, but there was quite a few, perhaps Sunak supporters who managed to get in, Oliver Dowden as well, coming back. What did you kind of make of it? You know, he wants to talk about unity and bringing the party back together. What did you make of the cabinet in general? So I thought it was was a very good selection of personnel. He wants to put his mark on the government. As a prime minister, new in post, you have a short window of opportunity to really create a government in your image. So of course, he's going to bring in some of his key allies. That's when you're at your most powerful, isn't it? In the first People like Mel Stride, but also given how fractious and divided, how incredibly fractious and divided my party's been. Yeah. He was very self-consciously, very de- deliberately 
doing a, a reshuffle to appeal to the breadth of the Conservative Party in Parliament and out there in the country and saying, look, we are one team. We need to come together. It is last chance saloon. We don't get another go at this. We've got an election coming at some point in the next two years. And so I, I, was, I was very pleased with it. Yeah. And I mentioned Swella Bravman there. That's probably the one contentious issue is seeing her back six days after being sacked or resigned over some pretty serious security breaches. What, what did you make of that? I mean, it felt as though it was a bit of a quid pro quo for her support for Rishi Sunak. Obviously, Number 10 have denied that, but it does feel as though it's a bit that way that perhaps Rishi Sunak wouldn't have hired her back had she not backed him potentially. Yeah, so Suella, she, she's emerged during the course of the last year or so as really quite a significant figure on the right of my party, both for the, the Brexiteers, but also the, the free marketeers as well. And she's effectively become a bit of a champion for that cause. And so, of course, Rishi wants to unify the party and include people in the tent. So he took a decision on balance, on advice from the cabinet secretary, given what we know to have happened previously and why she left office very recently. Yeah. You know, he's taken a decision that he wants her in the tent back in that role, which is one of the great offices of state. Rishi is a level-headed guy. He takes decisions coolly and on a balance of risk. So he's obviously content in himself yeah. that it's a secure appointment. Yeah. Does it not worry you slightly given what we're hearing? I saw Jake Berry coming out saying that there was multiple security breaches that led to her her leaving. I just wondered if having tried to bring the party back together, this is something that has a potential to perhaps to divide your fellow MPs again. Yeah, the, the truth is that very few people know exactly what went on and we hope that those people include the Prime Minister and the Cabinet Secretary who's who's advising on the appointments. It is ultimately Rishi's appointment. The yeah. Cabinet Secretary doesn't get to do the reshuffle. It is the Prime Minister's call. So the buck stops with him yeah. on this. I, I see in reading the press this morning that journalists are pulling at lots of different threads to see where this might go and they're fully entitled to do that and raise questions. I tell you what, for me, one of the most concerning things that appeared in, in one of the press stories this morning was a report that MI5 had concerns yeah. or was being invited to kind of give her a tutorial on handling emails and sensitive information. You never, ever want to see intelligence sources being quoted in relation to concerns to minister. The relationship between the Home Secretary, the Prime Minister and the intelligence community absolutely has to be yeah. very clear, very, very close and way away from yeah. from media speculation. So I think the Prime Minister want to get that sorted yeah. very, very quickly. Yeah. I'm just I'm just looking at the, the list of cabinet and some observations, some unsolicited observations. Go for it, Adam. Firstly, we always edit them out anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of a lot, yeah. Uh, there was some surprise that James cleverly kept his job. There was some talk he's going to be moved from foreign secretary. What I've heard is that, given the foreign context, i.e., a war in Ukraine, that the prime minister was keen to have a sense of continuity and stability in that part of government. There had been talk of Penny Murden or even Liam Fox, was someone I heard could be moved to that job, but James cleverly kept his job. And similarly with Northern Ireland, Chris Heaton, Harris and Steve Baker kept their jobs. Northern Ireland, incredibly difficult brief at the moment, very huge challenges over there. And again, there's that sense of continuity. With Penny Morden, I think people were expecting her to be elevated from her, the job she's been kept in, the Commons leader. And one thing that's been put to me was that had Penny Morden conceded earlier in the day, yeah. rather than take it right to the wire, yeah. she may have given herself a better job. Yeah, I've, I've heard that she was sort of punished job. for not dropping out, yeah. for, for pushing it all the way to the end. And also, I guess, just looking at the, uh, you know, we're, we're not surprised that there are MPs from right across the breadth of the Tory party in there. It's what we expected. If anything sort of surprised me or perhaps struck me was how many people are returning mm. to positions. It doesn't act exactly scream sort of fresh start does it when you very have, much deja vu at when this you point. have yeah. it's very back to the future isn't it when you have sort of Barkley, Rob, Braverman's contentious coming back well, well a reference for the kids but it's a bit like sort of Dallas isn't it you know Bobby Ewing in the shower Goodness, yeah. you know it's like it was all <laughs> just a, a dream that is a dated reference it was all just a dream you know we only had two people I think yeah. Victoria Prentice and Gillian Keegan are the only two people who've not been yeah. in cabinet before who are now it's in a sense it's, it's a retread of yeah. a lot of other people so, right? so, so, so perhaps I was expecting to see some more New faces. New faces in there, mm. if I was to... Stephen, what do you think about that? Well, I think he, he has gone for people with some experience. So you talked about Chris Heaton-Harris being kept on. Well, that was actually a very good appointment, we, kind of in a mode where we tend to write off everything Liz Truss did in her short time as Prime Minister. Actually, she did make some very smart appointments. Chris Heaton-Harris at Northern Ireland was, it was a good call. And mm. So keeping people in important jobs, doing important things at a sensitive time, like James Cleverley in the Foreign Office job, uh, is Im important. My guess is the Prime Minister will get one more go at doing a big reshuffle yeah. before the next election. Yeah. 
and there'll be another iteration and that might be the opportunity to really showcase the, the talent that he wants to bring forward and, yeah, yeah. and take into the election as our public facing team yeah but I mean ahead of that Ellie there's a lot of things to be getting on with it's not the easiest time to be taking over as as Prime Minister the other big decision that happened this week was it was announced that the medium term fiscal plan as it had been was moved for a second time Jeremy Hunt announced it was going to be moving back into the 17th of November you know what what are the reasons behind that what can we what can we kind of expect from that do we think well, first of all, it's not only been moved, it's gone from a fiscal statement to an autumn budget. It's yeah. been upgraded to a much bigger event. And I think, I forget the exact date, but before it was moved back, it's originally meant to be later in the month, Halloween, back the 17th. Yeah, November 23rd, then October yeah. 31st, in the sort of panic, and then now back to... November so I, I think there's two things to be to be taken from that. The first is giving Rishi Sunak a bit of time with his Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, who was one of the people that people were wondering if he would keep his job, yeah. if Rishi would want his own Chancellor, but he seems to have uh, decided to stick with him. And this gives them more time to create a brand new budget, more in, in Rishi's vision, perhaps. Mm. And also I've heard it suggested that by pushing it back that they can kind of improve the economic situation slightly over yeah. the next couple of weeks. Yeah, so when it comes to the OBR forecast, it will be a lot, lot, nice, lot nicer looking. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but but as, as part of that, Stephen, obviously they, there's going to have to be, there's lots of talk about difficult decisions, tough decisions, which we know tends to be code word for, for cuts and spending cuts. I just wondered what you kind of made of that. Or do you understand, given the circumstances, given what's happened, if that's going to be possible and... and you know, where those might come and and do you fear perhaps sometimes that there is going to be some pretty tough decisions to be made in in, in Whitehall? Everything that Jeremy Hunt has said since becoming Chancellor, and Rishi's kind of echoed it since becoming Prime Minister as well, is that there are some difficult choices to be made. There there is a hole in our budget that needs to get filled. Now, moving, uh, as the point's just been made, actually moving the fiscal statement, the budget, back until mid-November actually does improve the outlook because yeah. since Jeremy Hunt became Chancellor and we've got a new Prime Minister, the reaction in the city amongst the, on the trading floors has been a very positive one. And that has a real world impact that feeds through into the gilt market and what yeah. people anticipate to be future interest rates. And that affects overall government borrowing costs, which may reduce or in, in, increase the black hole, um, yeah. depending. And, and what we're expecting is actually an improved situation. Gas prices are also falling on international markets. They are, yeah. So actually, it might be a more benign scenario than what we had anticipated. And that might just ease some of those really hard choices yeah. that Jeremy Hunt needs to make. So, for example, triple lock, state pension. Will pensioners see their state pension go up by the full double digit 10% next April? That's There's been a question mark hanging over that. I don't think any Conservative MP really wants to see that dropped, particularly in the run-up to an election. Yeah. Um, linked to that then is the discussion about other social security benefits for working age people. Yeah. Will he have the resource to be able to do that? So that's some of the, the difficult mm. issues which have a social dimension as well as an economic Yeah, dimension. I know that's one of the things you've, you've yeah. been talking about before is, is whether uprating the benefits are going to be uprated in line with inflation or with, or with earnings. And, you know, do you think that Sunak has mentioned a lot of time, we spoke to his advisors earlier this week and they talked about going back to the manifesto. If it was in the 2019 manifesto, that's our sort of broad base for stuff. They're not going to try and breach the manifesto, perhaps in the way that the Trust administration looked at, at doing. Do you kind of trust that that is one of the things that is going to stick there as we go forward? Or do you think it's, it's one of the things that's still up for discussion? Well, the 2000 manifesto is really important because that's what's given us the mandate. Yeah. That, that was the text that the yeah. election was fought on in 2019. Um, obviously, the, the, the leader at the time, Boris Johnson, is no longer here, but the manifesto still stands. So I think Rishi is going to want to kind of stick to that as much as possible. But of course, every government has to respond to what's in front of it. And that's called pragmatism. And Rishi and his team will be pragmatic. When you think about some of the appointments he's made, Mel Stride at DWP. Now, Mel Stride, as chairman of the Treasury Select Committee, said recently benefits and state pension should be uprated yeah. in full. So now that he's inside the government... Is he going to be sticking to that position? It's going to be fascinating to see, but I'm optimistic, mm. given what I know of Rishi's instincts. Yeah. And as we saw during COVID, uh, the lockdown, the way that he did put together packages that really did actually help people at the bottom of the, the, the income chain. I'm optimistic that he'll... But is that going to be your big sort of pressing concern going forward? Is that the thing that you're going to be pushing on? I know you, you were on when, when Trust was around. Do you think there's going to be a need to perhaps push quite so hard on this kind of stuff? Or do you think that it's going to go that way yeah I think so I mean we need to see what the OBR forecasts are and how difficult things are but my kind of starting and end point really is that when times are difficult that's when government needs to 
kind of go above and beyond in helping people yeah. with, with the least in society. I think there are long-term question marks over triple lock sustainability. I've said that before in the past, but when you're in the middle of a cost of living crisis, when food inflation is 15% or more, yeah. and there are many, many pensioners who don't have generous private pension pots at all and rely primarily on the state pension, actually protecting that, I think, is a really, really important thing for a compassionate government to do. Mm. So, Stephen, one criticism of the trust. Premiership. I mean, it's not not a lot to go at really. It was only there for a few weeks, but was that one of the many reasons for its downfall was that she, the team, didn't talk enough to Tory about benches. There wasn't enough of a, a dialogue about this sort of thing. Do you get the impression from knowing Rishi as you do, and well, he's only been in power for a few days, that there will be a better dialogue between Downing Street and Tory about benches when it comes to discussions like this? Hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. In fairness, the time that Liz was Prime Minister was so short mm. and there was all of the, the, the state the uh, morning occasion the, yeah. around the, the, the funeral of Her Late Majesty that it's perhaps not, not fair to judge that. Mm. But we knew when Rishi was in, was in the Treasury, he was very good. His team were very good at reaching out to backbenchers when we had the rows around the £20 uplift to universal credit and ending that. He was very, very proactive himself and his special advisors. We would expect him to kind of bring that same approach into Downing Street. And it's going to be really, really crucial because part of his sell to the party in the country is that he can unify. Mm. Um, your, 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 fellow, uh, your fellow Welsh MP, Simon Hart, is, uh, is yeah, the new yeah. chief whip, but he was addressing the 1922 committee, wasn't he, uh, yesterday? And it seemed to be very the shortest 1922 meeting I've ever stood outside, and it seemed to be the most kind of happy and buoyant as, as MPs left. What, what would you kind of make of that? Yeah, yeah exactly. So you've got to understand that it feels like for us in the Conservative Party in Parliament, a weight has been lifted off our shoulders this week. I mean, it's been a really frenetic and intense uh, few weeks, few months. I mean, we were kind of gripped with fear and anxiety at the end of last week that, oh my God, here, here we go again. Another trip around the mountain of Conservative Party psychodrama. And it just feels like, Few. Yeah. Well, we got through that, and actually, we got a pretty sensible outcome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Ellie, you, you you're writing a piece for us for the weekend about this kind of feeling of, of relief. What have you kind of picked up uh, this week? Well, someone said to me that it feels like they've finally got a honeymoon period, which I think is really true. And you, you touched on, you know, the the when the Queen passed. Obviously, we went straight into mourning period within days after Liz Truss joining. She never got that honeymoon period mm. where everyone could kind of be joyous. Yes, we know got new leader, and here are all our plans. Everything went quiet for ten days or so, and then she had to go straight into these incredibly tough decisions and I think that played a big part in why things went the way they did but with Rishi it does feel like a lot of the colleagues that they're getting a chance to be sort of happy and talking mm. and having conversations and like you're saying being outside the 1922 committee there was a lot of optimism I'm hearing already that do people feel like oh thank goodness that's over uh, you know all the problems we had last week that finally they can sort of move on it's, it's, it's feeling very positive which it hasn't felt in a very long time. Stephen how big was your sigh of relief when, <laughs> Bar- when Boris Johnson said he wasn't going to be standing? It, 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 it was it was enormous actually and uh, um, he and I had an, an interaction on Sunday morning, actually, as, as it really? happened. And my advice to him was that the Conservative Party is, is not going to to wear it. it yeah, you, yeah. You, you coming back. And uh, despite the fact when I was out and about in my patch in Pembrokeshire on Friday last week, quite a number of people would, were coming up to me proactively and saying, make sure you back Boris. You know, he still yeah. remarkably has that resonance out there with a core of people in the country. I mean, it's probably an equal number who get excited the other way against him. Yeah. But in the Conservative base, he still has that pull. But just given everything that had gone on still fairly re- recently, it wasn't going to happen for him. Is uh, it come back on the cars, do you think, for him in the future? Do you think he could come back into Cabinet? There's been suggestions he could get a role maybe with Ukraine or something. Do you think he could come I mean, back in the fold? Look, he, 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 I can't help but like him, OK? Yeah. And despite all the disagreements I had with him over Brexit and other things, I can't help but like him. And he has got that likability that m- m- marks him out kind of quite exceptional for, mm. for the political class, if you want to call it that. Uh, who knows what, what politics will throw up in the future, Right now, though, it does feel, and hopefully if all of my colleagues in Parliament were here, Conservative colleagues, they would agree that the right outcome has been achieved. It was done fairly efficiently, could have perhaps been done even quicker, but thankfully we didn't need to go take this to the membership. We could get it sorted out and we're in a fairly good place, but we're still with a political mountain to climb. That's quite a nice segue, that, Stephen, because all the Tory MPs feel so... We've, We've talked about relief a lot. There is a sense of relief. There is a sense of right. We can sort of return to the business of what we're here to do, which is to govern and to make decisions. But as you said, Stephen, even with this sense of optimism, relative unity, 
there are still some huge challenges for the, con- for the Conservative Party coming up. It, it looks like it's going to be a pretty tough winter for people up and down the country. So Rishi Sunak does have a huge challenge ahead of him. And I guess that might take us to the question of Sunak versus Starmer. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to bring it back to that. Obviously, we had our first Prime Minister's questions. I thought actually Rishi Sunak was was pretty good. I think, although there were some difficult questions around Swallow Braveman and, and, and other things, his comments about levelling up over the summer that some people were unhappy about. But I thought actually Rishi Sunak had some pretty good answers to it and he kind of deflected it. I think we're going to see a different style of Prime Minister's question. I was actually in the, it was in, in the chamber and, I, and very full conservative benches and were very boisterous. I thought actually they were, they were screaming more over and over and over again. It feels like they were, you know, having a good time. But, you know, what, what do we think, where do we kind of see the future battles between the two of them playing out? Well, PMQs in normal times is when the two respective party leaders... It's not, I guess, journalists like us, we get so obsessed with who won. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then the Twitter timeline is full of takes of who won PMQs. But I think PMQs really, if you're a strategist, is about setting out long-term dividing lines, arguments that come election time are in people's minds. And I thought we we saw the beginnings of that Mm. in that Prime Minister's question. It wasn't about personality or scandal or questions of characteristics like we saw, which dominated Starmer Johnson PMQs for so long. This was much more about policy. I think you could tell that Michael Gove and Oliver Dowden had been involved in Rishi Sunak's prep for PMQs. I don't know what you thought, Stephen, because you've sat, you're, you're a PMQs v- veteran, I hope you won't be five, insulted five, if I describe you in that way. Fifth conservative but leader at PMQs it now. Felt, it felt like that, that we're returning to what we sort of recognise as, as Absolutely. Uh, people shouldn't overrate the importance, as you say, of, mm. of Prime Minister's question time, but it is important for party morale. And it's an important test of whether your party leader, whether they're the Prime Minister or the leader of the opposition, can deploy effectively lines of attack or defence that sound credible and that the party members can rally to. That's what it's a test of. It's a, it's a kind of gladi- gladiatorial thing mm. that is a kind of bit of a shop window on the wider political debates that are going on. And what I think Rishi demonstrated yesterday, as we saw when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer, he is quick on his feet, he can think, he can deploy uh, effective and credible lines. And that that's good. You know, we like that. And I think Prime Minister's question time in the, in the weeks and months ahead will be interesting because you've got two intelligent, rational people, um, quite likeable people, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, going, going hand-to-hand over some of the big issues of the day. And you know, we obsess about all the internal stuff. Actually, it has a real-world impact, all of this. We are talking about things that will affect families and businesses up and down the country. Yeah, I mean, we, there was sort of a bit of discussion this week about what Labour's plan of attack was going to be, about whether, you know, Sunak's wealth is going to be a factor, whether there's idea that he might be a bit out of touch, you know, being a billionaire, that sort of stuff. And, and also the fact is that he is not scandal free in a sense that he was tarnished by a lot of the party gate stuff how do you how do you feel the party is going to try and sort of counter that stuff and how how, you, how successful do you think that's going to be with the electorate do you think i don't think the, the party gate stuff will count for anything now i think the book is shut on that one as far as rishi sunak is concerned in terms of his personal circumstances and the, and the family wealth well i think people have been far more interested in the decisions that he takes and and the values that inform those decisions and on that score, he's got a good track record. We look back at what he did as Chancellor during uh, lockdown, and he, he'll be judged on that. I think it would be a mistake for the Labour Party to, to major on that yeah. point, because it will look churlish and it will look uh, a bit mean-spirited, actually, because what the snapshot, I think, that Rishi Sunak is giving to the country is that, actually, he's quite likeable. You know? yeah. People make very crude, quick judgments about political leaders, the people who are, aren't like us, who don't tune in obsessively to these things. And the snapshot that I think they're getting of Rishi Sunak is that actually, mm. okay, he might be super rich, banker, but he's super smart. He strikes us as hardworking and sensible, level-headed, and we'll take that. Yeah, that's it's, probably it's, not a bad thing. Feels like Ellie, like yeah. the, going back to the pandemic, he, the sort of dishy Rishi and all the memes, that sort of stuff. But actually, there was that attack video, wasn't there, about him? You know, about his his wealth and his links to California and stuff. But in the end, it felt like that was just in a sense, sort of slightly aspirational. People actually sort of saw that and thought, I quite like that idea of, of having someone like that in, in, in Chancellor and, and whether that's going to translate now as he's PM as well, do you think? Yeah, it's interesting. There was some word cloud that was put out by some pollsters recently and rich was just the biggest word by, yes. by a long yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. I think people are aware that he is 
very, very wealthy. And yeah, it's a known quantity now, isn't it? A known yeah. quantity, but I don't think it is necessary. People are thinking of him badly because of it. They mainly remember him for pandemic, eat out to help out. No one really cared back then. He was just as wealthy back in the pandemic, yeah. but no one particularly was particularly bothered then. They were more concerned, you know, are we getting our furlough? Can I get half price meals? <laughs> and he made himself very popular during that time because he was a good communicator. He seemed to have some, some good ideas and he was very consistent. I think you're right. I think it would be a very poor choice for Labour to go on that attack yeah. line because while people are aware that he's rich, it's just a fact mm. now. And also a lot of it is, isn't even his own wealth, it's his wife's wealth. Yeah. So it's, it's then you're moving into the territory, you know, attacking his family and stuff. And that's a very, very kind of low... I, also, like, I, think if, I don't think wealth is the issue. I mean, look at who this country's elected over the last... <laughs> <laughs> Boris Johnson, <laughs> Theresa May, David Cameron, you know, they're doing all right, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> I think the issue is, it's not wealth, it's when you're wealthy, but then there's a, there's a sense of hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, yeah, or a sense of double standards, or a sense of being out of touch. Yeah. I think that's the risk. I don't yeah. think it's he is wealthy, therefore, you know, that makes him vulnerable. But I do think, I think Labour, I agree that if they do go down that path of personal attacks, I think that would be an error because I don't think it would be particularly effective. I think what Labour is going to try and do is link any economic pain this country has over the next six to 12 months, whether it be, I don't know, food inflation or... Mortgages. Mortgages or rent. They're going to try and link that to Rishi Sunak's time as Chancellor and just the fact that he's been there. Why, why would you say... I, so I, I get the impression that Labour will go for policy and go for decisions that Rishi Sunak's been involved in rather than point out that, mm. you know, he's rich mm. or that he wears loafers mm. or, that, or, or <laughs> whatever else... Um, yeah, yeah, whatever yeah. else is happening in the Sunak discourse yeah I, I th the non-DOM stuff I, as I well, think yeah. it would be a mistake one thing I know that Labour are going to go go after is on, on levelling up there was those conversations he was recorded speaking in the leadership contest in the summer in Tunbridge Wells and the way that Labour are sort of playing it out as making it seem as though he wants to take money away from you know, deprive northern communities and, and spend it in leafy places in, in, in Kent. Uh, I must say, I, I do live just nearby. So uh, an interest, <laughs> I, I declare an interest in that. But, you know, I, I think he was trying to explain that, you know, there are sort of poor rural areas exactly. as well as, as as well as city areas. What did you kind of make of that? And do you think that, you know, by having Michael Gove back at levelling up, do you think that's kind of an important step to show that actually he's committed to that original idea of levelling up as set out in 2019? So just on your last point first, Michael Gove going back to levelling up is really, really important because those brief few weeks under Liz Truss, it wasn't clear whether levelling up was still going to be a guiding light for yeah. Conservative policy for the remainder of this parliament. And so this, what Rishi's done is signal absolutely we are committed to, to meeting the spirit of the 2019 manifesto. On the video, what he was doing there, and he was obviously appealing to a Conservative audience for Conservative votes during the leadership election, but he was trying to get across the point exactly that there are poor people, poor communities in areas that are considered as a whole quite well off and he believes and I think there's a fair point here that money should be better spent on poor people wherever they are in the UK not just regions that are classified in inverted commas as, as poor and deprived but perhaps the words that he used because he was in a particular political context weren't the best chosen at the time. Mm. Just finally last time I hosted this podcast Liz Truss was, was Prime Minister mm. now um, do we think by the time we host it next week that Rishi Sunak will still be the Prime Minister? Do we think, or do we think <laughs> oh we'll I hope else? so <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can handle covering not, another resignation. I am I, it does feel when we, when we spoke about this before with Stephen it does feel like we've entered a period of relative calm Famous last words Fa Very know. famous last words it feels like now the, the discussion is going to move away from personality and character and scandal and towards policy yeah and we're going to have a few months of sort of heated but healthy policy debate which takes place in what feels like a normal political environment but if this Tory party is good at anything <laughs> <laughs> it's, Stephen's uh, grim ser serving, up, serving up chaos and psychodrama yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it is it's defying our expectations <laughs> and um, you know let, let's um, let's see I yeah. hope final got, word to you Stephen well then. I hope we've got all of this out of our system for the time being and uh, it's about the national interest this this reshuffle Rishi becoming prime minister was about uniting the party but more importantly it was about putting the government in a shape to take sensible decisions at a difficult time now whether that has a political payoff for us two years down the line at an election isn't the primary question although we hope that we will see that but it's about you know getting government back onto a sensible and pragmatic course so that's all we've got time for this week thanks so much to my colleagues adam payne and ella langford our special guest stephen crabb and our editor was laura silver Thanks again to you all for listening. Please subscribe to your podcast to keep up to date. If you've enjoyed it, then please leave us a review. And if you want to get in touch, reach out to us on Twitter at Politics Home or email us via news at politicshome.com. 
And if you want to keep up to date with all our great reporting and analysis from Politics Home and our colleagues at The House magazine, you can subscribe to our daily newsletters. Just click on the sign-up link in the top right-hand corner of the website. But for now, have a great weekend. I've been Alan Tolhurst, and this has been The Rundown.